Okay, good morning, everyone. I see the last few people are starting to arrive now, so I think we'll get started. And um, for those of you who don't know, my name is Maria Keeney, and um, on behalf of Smurfit Executive Development, I'm delighted to welcome you here this morning. Um, it's great to have my colleague, Camilla Beglin, here with us this morning, um, who's going to be discussing fearless leadership. Um, uh, Camilla Beglin is actually the Programme Director of our Diploma in Leadership Development, uh, which is starting on the 25th of February. She's also an executive coach, a leadership development consultant who works in a number of global organizations and location in Europe, the US and Asia. Camilla has a BA in international marketing and languages from GCU, an MBA from UCD, and a master's in executive coaching from Ashbridge uh, Business School. I'm going to be back with you at the end of the webinar to put any questions that you have to Camilla. So please do include them in the chat at the bottom throughout the webinar and we'll get through as many as possible. I'll also be discussing our Diploma in Leadership Development, which I mentioned, and that's starting on the 25th of February. So if you are interested and you have any questions, please do stay on at the end. So without further ado, I will pass you on to Camilla and enjoy the webinar. Thanks, Camilla. Great. Thank you very much, Maria, um, and welcome, everybody. Uh, it's a very kind introduction. It's always a little strange to kind of hear your CV read out as you sit there uh, listening to it, um, but very kind. I I've been working in organizations uh, for over 30 years now, um, and I, you know, spend kind of all my time now in that space between, you know, what leaders are capable of doing and what they're currently doing. And of course, that space can be wide or it can be narrow. Uh, and I work with individuals and with teams and with organizations in that space. So how can they close that gap if they choose to close that gap? And choice is a, a very important watchword for me in, in, in all the work that I do. Um, so as part of that, as, as Maria said, I have the, the privilege of being the program director for the leadership diploma in, in Smurfit Executive Education. And this morning, I'm going to spend the next um, probably around 30 minutes uh, talking to you a little bit about this topic of leadership and specifically fearless leadership. Uh, I will kind of uh, unapologetically refer to my notes as I go through. So if you see me glancing off to the right, that's what I'm doing. And um, this is a topic that's fairly close to my heart. So uh, I have a tendency to go off down rabbit holes if I don't kind of keep myself on track. And there's a couple of things that I do want to share with you. So I'll refer to my notes to, to remind me of where I am and, and where I want to go. Um, and so you might ask, you know, why this topic of fearless leadership? Why, why do we call it that? Uh, or why are we um, uh, naming this webinar uh, something around fearless leadership? And it is because really of the extent of fear that we see in organizations. And just to give us a little sense of that, uh, I'll share my screen for a second. So um, just a, a, a pictographical representation of what that is, uh, what fear looks like and feels like. And hopefully that's not a representation of how you feel every day. But I think it is normal in my experience for people to feel quite fearful in organizations, in, in leading people, um, regardless of the level that they're at. And, you know, fear has, has um, a tendency to drive us to do things, sometimes things that we would prefer not to do. Uh, and also stops us doing things that we think might be useful. So for instance, the sort of things that we have a tendency to avoid uh, are kind of difficult conversations. You know, that could be a conversation with somebody above you who, um, where you want to say, look, these expectations are currently unrealistic, uh, but you might be fearful of having that conversation or, you know, a conversation with a peer where, you know, there's some sort of tension in the relationship or a conversation with a direct report where, you know, something that they're doing is, or not doing is kind of not aligned with what your expectations are. And so, you know, I would say that a lot of the dysfunction that I see in organizations comes from the avoidance of those sort of conversations. And we avoid them primarily because we have some level of fear, you know, fear that they'll be uncomfortable or, you know, fear that, that we're going to damage the relationship or, you know, or that something will happen to us ultimately. Um, and fear also can tend to drive us towards doing things that we're not comfortable with. So 
doing something that just doesn't sit right with us, um, you know, is counter to our value system somehow. Um, but we're afraid not to do it because we think that will have consequences for us or indeed run ourselves ragged, run ourselves and our, our teams ragged because we're fearful of not doing that. Um, and, you know, th the consequences we think of can be can be smaller ones or very severe ones, you know, so we can think, oh, well, you know, I might, if I don't do that, I might not be valued and um, I might not be rated the way I like to be rated. Or we might think, uh, you know, if I don't do that, I might not get the promotion that I hope to get or, you know, I might not be visible in the way that I'd like to be visible. I might not get the remuneration. Um, or indeed, in, in extreme thinking, I, I might lose my job. Um, and then, of course, you know, our brain can go into the stratosphere in terms of, you know, if I lose my job, then, oh, my God, I lose my family and then I lose my house and then I'll end up on the streets, you know. So that sort of um, catastrophizing uh, happens, you know, often. Um, and, you know, hopefully it doesn't happen too often to you. But if it does, all of this, everything that I'm describing is kind of normal and natural stuff. So, you know, if you if some of this has resonances for you, either in terms of kind of the fears or the sort of behaviors that that drives, and um, then, you know, you are absolutely not alone. I think there's a good chance it will have resonances for lots of people who are here because that's our experience of working with groups is that, you know, this is very, very normal. Um, and and it tends to be untalked about. So one of kind of our missions in the work that we do is is to normalize this sort of stuff and that it's OK. So it's normal and it's very powerful. So, you know, if the if the threat circuits in our brain are activated, that's a survival mechanism and that's really strong. And so something that that activates those threat circuits is more powerful uh, than something that activates the reward circuits. So, so if we have a fear about things, it's very strong. It can take a strong hold on us. Um, and, you know, it happens to many of us as we lead kind of every day. Um, and it has consequences. So it's normal, it's powerful, and it has consequences. Because, you know, if our... Um, uh, you know, if our, our, our sympathetic nervous system is kind of always on, uh, that kind of has us in a fight or flight mode all the time. And that, you know, as neuroscientists would say, that puts us into dysregulation. So we're dysregulated as we go throughout the day. And then we don't have access to our best thinking. It's very uncomfortable and we don't have access to our best thinking. And it doesn't allow us the space to, to recover you know, it doesn't allow the, the parasympathetic system space to allow us to recover. And so this is important stuff to understand about how we behave, what it is that we're doing every day and the impact that it have, has on us. Uh, because we are going to have to lead through all sorts of kind of environmental shocks, you know, big global shocks like the pandemic. And, um, you know, none of us could have predicted that or very few of us could have predicted that or the global crisis in 2008, you know? And so these big glo global shocks happen. And um, then at another level, industry shocks happen, you know? So depending on what industry you're in, if you look at the car industry, that's undergoing massive change now. So that, you know, what the, moving from fossil fuel to electric, moving from driving to self-driving, moving from kind of more hardware mechanical to software, moving from owning a car to hiring a car. So if you're in that industry, these are huge shocks and you're having to lead your organizations and your teams through that. So, so they're the sort of shocks that you can have. Or it can be for you, it can be organizational specific. So for instance, your organization might be in the middle of a merger or an acquisition or indeed a restructure or multiple restructures, since restructuring is kind of the default mode for senior management when there's some sort of external shock um, or even when there isn't. And so you might be going through that at an organizational level. And then we experience as leaders uh, shocks around our, our own team. So somebody who's kind of the linchpin of the team decides, oops, I've got a better offer somewhere else and I'm off and it's completely unexpected. And suddenly we have to deal with how do we manage through that transition? 
or indeed because of one of those restructurings that I was talking about, suddenly your team has, has doubled um, or your team has halved or your role is entirely different. You know, so, so these sort of team shocks happen. Um, and then, you know, we, we all encounter personal shocks. So health shocks, family shocks, you know, mobility issues. So all of this stuff happens. And as, as people and as leaders, you know, we need to find a way of managing through that because those sort of shocks are inevitable. They will happen. Now, I am very, I'm acutely aware that on a Monday morning, I might um, have driven people to the edge of desperation in all this talk, talk about fear and, and shocks. Um, and if I have apologies for that. But the good news is that there are things that we can do about it. Um, and I'm going to just, um, so my intention is not to stress you out. My intention is to talk about what are the things that we can do about that. So, sorry about this. Um, you know, there is a way that you can manage through all of this. Um, and, and, you know, I'm sure that you're all managing as it is. But if the sort of stuff that I talk about in terms of being fearful, at whatever level that fear happens for you, if that is kind of real for you and live for you, then there are ways that you can you can manage that. There are ways that you can deal with that better. Um, you know, it does take some work. It takes some self-reflection. It takes some willingness to practice doing something different. Um, but the prize, the prize is great. The prize is that you get to lead in a way that feels more congruent for you, um, that feels more comfortable, that is less fearful, and that leads to better outcomes for you. So that, that's the prize. And that's the thing that I would invite you you know, if, as I said, this is real for you, to hold on to, that that, that is, that is the, that prize is there. So if that's the case, then what are these things that we could do in order to support us? Um, well, a starting point often is understanding ourselves a little bit more. So increasing our, our self-awareness, you know, so what are my personal patterns of, of thinking, of feeling, of behaving? You know, how do I see myself? How do I see other people? How do I see the world? You know, and what are the consequences of me seeing those things in that way? So what does that drive in terms of the way that I behave? And you know, are those patterns, if I take them out and look at them, are those patterns serving me well? Now, as people who are, you know, I'm making an assumption here, operating within organizations, you know, you will already be having some level of success and therefore you know your patterns will be serving you well at some level and sometimes our patterns serve as well and sometimes we get to a stage in our career where you know those patterns are no longer serving as well or we're feeling hmm now we're getting a little stuck or you know we're getting a little um derailed or plateaued in our career so there's something we have this feeling that there's something about our pattern that's kind of not working for us anymore or is not working for us in certain circumstances you know and if that's the case then being able to examine what are those patterns you know how how are they driving me and could i perhaps shift those patterns um, is an important exploration and then, you know, if, if you think, okay, well, now I understand myself a little bit better. I understand what drives my thinking. I understand that that's a particular perspective and it is my perspective and it is a valuable perspective. And there might be other perspectives that I might also want to accommodate. Then I might start thinking about, okay, so how do I engage with other people? You know, do I trust people or do I have a tendency to sort of sit back and think, okay, I'll, I'll wait here now until I'm very secure uh, that this person is trustworthy. You know, what's my approach, for instance, to trust? You know, do I listen well? You know, do I listen well, even if I don't love what I'm hearing? Um, am I very attached to my own perspective and really not very open to hearing another perspective? You know, am I unpracticed in articulating what it is that I want? what it is that I need, what is my perspective, and in valuing my own perspective. You know, perhaps I'm unpracticed in that. Now, perhaps you're great at all of that. And if you are, that's wonderful. And if 
there are some of you who are thinking, yeah, there's some of that stuff that, you know, I could be, I could be, let's use the term better at, or, or that could be working for me better. Um, then that's really about, uh, you know, uh, about practicing that and becoming what we would say relationally more capable. And becoming relationally, relationally more capable is a really important part of leadership because it's not anymore about doing tasks. It's about leading other people. So it's really important that we understand this idea of relationality as opposed to taskiness or, or, or kind of um, kind of machineness of organizations. Because even though relationality is really important in terms of getting things done and getting good outcomes, organizations tend to persist with sort of tasky, machiney thinking. So lots and lots of effort invested in, you know, structures and restructures and processes and procedures and measurement and all of that sort of machiney stuff. And I'm not saying that there isn't a place for that. You know, some of that is important and useful. What I am saying is it tends to be the default mode in organizations and it tends to suck energy and time from the relational stuff. Um, you know, an example that comes to mind when, when I was a consultant in a previous life, we used to do organization design. Um, and, you know, you'd see organizations and you'd go in and ask them, well, why, you know, they'd, they'd be drawing all these new boxes and you'd be saying, oh, why are you drawing these new boxes? And when you ask kind of again and again, and you kind of peel back the layers, you discover, oh, well, in the current series of boxes, you know, there's somebody in this box who's you know, performing very well, you know, um, but, you know, quite dysfunctional in lots of ways. And so we're doing this kind of new series of boxes so we can put this person in this box and they can sort of do less damage over there while they can still do all this great stuff for us. Now, you know, so an organization that would go to the level of doing a restructure when probably the more appropriate response will be to say, listen, Jack, or whatever his name is, or her name is. Do you know what? We really love this stuff that you do. It's really important, really valuable. Um, this other stuff over here, not so much. So we'd like to have a conversation about that. Um, and so we do an inordinate amount of work in organizations as a workaround to avoid kind of the relational stuff. And the relational stuff is really, really important. I, I mean, another example that comes to mind um, was a, a, a CTO of a big organization that I worked with. And he used to say to me, but Camilla, you know, like all of us, all the heads of engineering across all the different territories, you know, they all say that they agree to this thing um, and then they go away and, and they don't do it. And so I said, okay, Matthias, well, you know, let's sit in on your, he said, we have this, we have this great steering group meeting. And he said, you know, everybody comes to it and they agree everything. I said, okay, let's sit in. And so I sat in on this meeting and, you know, it's a very long table, you know, and Matthias is at one end of it and all the heads of engineering from the different countries are, are on the other side, you know, organizations are very interesting in terms of how they're architecturally set up, you know, how you know, watch how power is in an organization. So Matthias is at the end of it. And then he has this amazing agenda on a big screen. And just one look at this agenda and you can see there's zero space for any discussion. Like there's all these things that have to be agreed and there's tiny amounts of time. Um, and so Matthias opens a topic and, you know, he says now, you know, is there, you know, are people in agreement with that? And a couple of people sort of put up their hand and go, uh, Matthias, uh, could we talk about, well, no, we don't really have time to talk about that today. And so we move systematically through this very tight agenda. Um, and by lunchtime, you know, it's all done. And he says, now, you see, they agree. And, and then they'll go away and they'll do something different. And um, so what you could see is that Matthias kind of really believed that this was an important mechanism in terms of getting agreement but didn't understand the importance of some space to discuss and to, to read the reactions in the room and, and to be able to, to have a conversation around whether that was going to be useful for them or not. And equally, equally, the heads of engineering, you could argue, were kind of complicit with that in the sense that they, 
they they at some level decided okay we're you know we're not being given the space to discuss this so we'll just go back and do whatever it is that we want to do and so you know Matthias needed to leave them space and they also needed to be able to say Matthias could we have a conversation around how this is structured as a way of engaging because it's really not working in terms of us all getting to the outcomes that we want um so, you know, we talk about the soft stuff in organizations, which is a really inappropriate word because it's really about the hard stuff, because the hard stuff is about engaging well in organizations. And there's some very interesting recent research uh, done by, um, uh, what's his name, Jack, I think, Tony Jack in Harvard. And he talks about the, the analytical neural networks in our brain. So the part of the brain that allows us to crunch numbers and look at measurement and all that good stuff, that's really important. Um, and that there's also the, the empathetic neural network or the social neural network. And the social neural network is around understanding people and being able to collaborate and, and um, you know, understanding when people need something and being able to read their emotions and so on. Now, it was always known that two different parts of the brain were responsible for those things. What Tony Jack discovered is that those parts of the brain were what he called antagonistic. So in other words, if one was on, the other was off. So one suppressed the other. Um, and this is very significant because, you know, what I love about neuroscience is it's suddenly showing us the science behind what it is that we've been seeing in organizations for a long time. Because often I see leadership teams and work with leadership teams who are highly tasky, very intelligent, very numerate, and um, very focused, very focused. And that's the thing about the analytical neural networks. It allows a lot of focus, but it excludes loads of data. The data being what's going on with the people in the organization. And so people don't understand, often leadership teams who are very analytical, just don't understand, well, why are the people not coming with us? Or why are the outcomes not being achieved? Why are the business, the hard business outcomes not being achieved? And it is because they haven't read other people appropriately. They haven't understood how you engage people, how people engage each other. And, and, and the really um, uh, dangerous thing, if you like, or discomforting thing for those sort of leadership teams is that many of the things that people want in organizations, like collaboration or outside the box thinking, uh, creativity, um, comes from the social neural network, not from the analytical neural network. So if we've closed down the social neural network, then we're not going to get that sort of stuff in organizations. So the result is that, is that leaders, good leaders need to be able to do both of these things. They need to be able to turn on the analytical neural networks and they need to be able to turn on the social neural networks. Um, and so that's, you know, if, if, you know, this is interesting for me, for you. There's something about being able to understand uh, where where do you tend to play, and and you know what is the piece that you need to start being mindful of. What's the piece that you need to pay attention to? Um, and so, if then you understand a little bit more about yourself, and then if you're kind of getting better, if you like, at relational your relational capability and understanding the importance of that then being able to take that learning into a kind of systems view. So, you know, what pressure does a system or your system bring to bear on the decisions that you can make as a leader? Um, systems are, are very powerful and they're subject to constant motion. Um, so you'll have heard this idea of, um, you know, does, does a, a butterfly flapping its wings in Brazil lead to a, um, a tornado in, in Texas. Um, that notion that small adjustments in the system kind of have a huge impact somewhere else. And you know where I've seen that play out in organizations is you can have, have somebody who has agreed something that they need to do with the people above them. And they're working away on that thing, whatever it is, and working with their teams and working very hard. It's all been agreed what it is that they have to do. And they, they do a really good job and they do all the analysis and you know all the recommendations and whatever it is that needs to happen. 
And then they bring it to some sort of kind of senior forum of the organization. And they discover that either it's, it's kind of diluted down or it's kind of moved to some other department or, um, or in fact, it's kind of thrown out altogether. And they come out of those meetings really, really demotivated and angry and kind of embarrassed because they have to go back to the team and say it happened and, you know, feeling all sorts of, you know, negative emotions. And, you know, part of that is because they didn't have a systems awareness. They didn't understand that something had happened within that wider system, which made that thing no longer important. And so, you know, if we increase our relational capability, it means we can have conversations within the system. And that allows us to start picking up hmm, what's going on in this system, what is important in this system, and what's important today as opposed to what was important six months ago. And so being able to stand outside our system and look in and have conversations is really, really important if we want to be able to get things done in organizations. Um, you know, I remember one lady in, in an organization and it was an organization undergoing massive changes, like a number of changes of CEO, a number of restructurings, rumors of mergers and acquisitions, and um, whole divisions being changed, moving from kind of territory based, to divisional based and back again, you know, all that stuff that goes on in very large corporates. And this lady, you know, kind of systematically moved through all of these changes with kind of particular things that she wanted to get done. And she managed to get them all done, you know, despite all that change. And when I noticed what it was that she was doing, I noticed that she was systemically very aware. And she also wasn't too attached to exactly the way she was going to do something. She had a kind of a guiding light in terms of what she wanted to do, but she was watching what was happening. She was reading the tea leaves, as we say. Um, and she was having conversations and then she'd say, okay, we need to adjust this. Maybe we need to let go of this one. We need to change the language over here. But in the end, she got to um, implement the things that she wanted to implement. And it was because of that system awareness. And when you become aware of the system, you may find, oh, there are limitations in the system in terms of what I want to do. And equally, you may discover uh, and in, even in parallel, you may discover, oh, there's opportunities within the system in terms of what I can get done. So that's something else that we would encourage you is to start think about um, systems awareness, having a systems awareness. So I am conscious of time. I think I'm probably going to, uh, but before I stop, maybe I'll just um, share something with you. Um, see if I can bring this up. We already had that one, didn't we? So, hmm, okay. Not very good at this, as you can see. So I'll stop the share for a second. So I'll bring back my share. Apologies for this. Um, so Eric Byrne, who was a, um, a Swiss-American psychologist, once said, the destiny of every human being is decided by what goes on inside his skull when confronted by what goes on outside his skull. And the thing is, we have the power over this. We can, we can do this sort of stuff. And so, you know, if we think of this as the fearless leader, um, and hello to any Scots among us, and congratulations on the rugby at the weekend, <laughs> um, then that's probably not the right archetype because it's more about just being more of you. It's about you being more of you and you being more comfortable you so that you can be a more fearless leader. Or let, let's make the bar a little lower, a less fearful leader. Um, so I'm going to stop there, Maria. Um, I think that's certainly long enough to be listening to me. And uh, yeah, I'm going to hand it back over. So sorry, I'm going to stop the share. That's great. Thank you, Camilla. Plenty of food for thought. And I see the questions coming in here, so I'll get stuck straight into them. Um, the first one is, can you motivating upwards in these strange times? I feel that my director has lost focus and motivation because of COVID-19. I feel this is affecting the organization and the rest of the management team. What strategies could we employ to arrest this? 
And I, I'm not sure I got the very beginning of the question, Maria, um, would, uh, but, but I think I have a sense so of it's it. About, uh, yeah, okay. So um, it's about how do you um, motivate upwards? Yeah, well, you know, it's, it, it's, it's a great question. Um, and you can see that what's happening probably for that person is that they are kind of in stress. So they're under fear. And that's often what we forget. We forget that the people above us are also subject to all of this stuff, all of the stresses. And they may not be coping as well as we're coping. And, you know, what people need when they're going through that sort of stress is they need space and they need some empathy. So it's often hard to be able to provide that to someone um, if they're more senior to us. And in particular, if their, their stress may be kind of uh, um, coming out in terms of, of some sort of aggression or, or, or anger. Um, and yet that's what they need. So what they need is space to just chat and uh, to just say, you know, check in how people are. And um, that's a really important thing to remember. And, and that would be the starting point is really to have a conversation to say, you know, let's have a chat about, you know, how we all are, because that makes it a little less threatening for the particular person. So could we have a threat about or a chat about how we all are and uh, see how we're coping because this is a really difficult time. And maybe if we're able to just talk about that, um, it would make it kind of less, less, less scary. Uh, and then the person could, could refocus because what you're saying is, I think, I, I can't remember exactly the language, but, but, but if our, if our, you know, if we're constantly in the kind of um, sympathetic nervous system mode, we are not thinking, we do not have access to our cognitive function. So until we can kind of calm down that system, we can't get to good thinking. And the only way somebody can support that is to be our, this is a great word to be our, um, psychobiological regulator, which means really it's kind of like being our best friend. <laughs> it's like somebody who will listen to us and really listen to us. So that's what comes to mind, Maria. Okay, great. And um, there's someone else asking here as well, can you give us some tips on how to develop your systems awareness, especially in a situation where you are only a remote leader? Yeah, great question. And many of the things that I've talked about today are um, are even more acute, if you like, in, in, in this virtual world. Um, and what I've noticed is that people are so busy. In fact, I think people are busier than ever now uh, in, in this COVID situation um, that they, they don't have the time for the short conversations, what I would call the in-between moments. And often it's in those in-between moments that we pick up what's going on in the system. So in fact, we have to be much more mindful about it. And the only tip I can suggest is that we need to be creating space in our agenda to have conversations that are not specifically related to some sort of operational matter. And that's not always easy because like the last uh, questioner said, you know, sometimes our own bosses are in a difficult space, so it's hard to do that. But then I would say, reach out further. You know, even people that you had contact with in the organization who you might have short chats with, but now you haven't had access to that make the time for those short chats. It's very difficult because we're on calls on Zoom all day. And I think it's incredibly important. Yeah, actually following on from that, Camilla, it might be on, on the same point. Um, the, here, the leader who is, finds himself constantly focused on the employees with issues rather than on the ones that are doing well and is worried about that, that they're not, not um, I suppose, focused on the ones that are doing well as well and, and they're not getting the time with them. Yeah, yeah. And, and this is really always the challenge of leadership, isn't it? How do I allocate my time in a way that supports everybody on my team? And, you know, all of those people do need support. So the instinct of the questioner is absolutely <laughs> right, which is that the people who are doing well also need kind of some words of support. Now, you know, again, in terms of tips and tricks, they often don't need as much time, but they, but the short amount of time you can provide can be really useful to them just to be able to tell them that they're doing really well. So that's really important. Um, and yes, sometimes I think we do spend excess time on somebody who's very, very stuck. Um, and, and if that stuckness is, um, is kind of manifesting itself in a, what we would call a rebellious child, sort of behaviors, you know, we can spend a kind of a disproportionate amount of time there. And while I would always advocate that we need to try to understand what's going on for them, because most people kind of want to do a good job. So it, it, listening really carefully is important. 
um, yeah, yeah, it is important that you divide your time. This is the subject of a very long, we could have a very long conversation on this. And um, I, I think the thing is, as a leader, that we understand that people need us more than ever. So in the old world, when people were in buildings, there was a kind of a sense that we could rely as leaders on the, the sort of scaffolding of the organization to support our people. What I mean by that is, you know, we knew that our people could go to their peer and have a chat, or we knew that they could go to, you know, HR and have a chat if they wanted. So we, we kind of could outsource our, you know, um, our engagement or our, our leadership kind of responsibility for the people to that sort of edifice, if you like. And now that's gone, it's stripped away. And what leaders are finding is that, oops, I really do have to spend more time with my people. And I think recognizing that that's now the job, that's the job. The job is not the, the plan or whatever it is. The job is helping the people to do the plan or the implementation. And that, and in some ways, it's only bringing into focus the sort of things that probably should have happened in in the old world, if you like, in the offices, you know, where people weren't outsourcing, if you like, the management of people to something or somebody else. And um, now that's really that's really in in, in focus. Great. And uh, I have someone here who's who's considering the diploma in leadership development, but they're wondering: is leadership a, an innate talent, or is it something that you can learn? Oh, I love that question. <laughs> no, that's why I put up the, the, the William Wallace versus the you. You know, everybody can be a good leader. And in fact, leadership is one of these things that's so, um, it, it, it's so all around us. You know, we lead, we lead families, we lead teams, we sometimes lead clubs. And, um, you know, so, so we do a lot of leadership anyway in, in, our, in our life. And, you know, everybody can get better at that. It is about wanting to, it's about a choice. Um, but I've seen people kind of in, um, change significantly um, how they are as leaders because they've shifted something about their own mindset. About, and then they, once they shifted their mindset, they shifted their behaviors. And then once they shifted their behaviors, people responded to them in a different way. So we get this kind of virtuous cycle. So the good news is that everybody can be a good leader. Great. Um, and I actually think this person was on um, another one of our webinars about purpose because they're, they're asking how important is it to know your own purpose to be a good leader? Yeah, I, um, if you know your own purpose, it's, it's very useful um, and it kind of provides you with that sort of guiding light. Um, and so any sort of reflection around that is really, really useful. Um, so I would say it's a, it's a really good thing in, and it also helps you in terms of determining how you make decisions, how you spend your time, how you spend your energy, even more importantly than your time. Um, and, and for some people, it's not completely obvious. Um, so often then we'd say, well, you know, where to start is to look at what your values are, what's really important to you. Because when people do that, they can usually get to, you know, there's a couple of things that are really important to me. And then we can start thinking, okay, well, if they're the things that are really important to me, how do I use them kind of to support my, my exploration around my purpose, if you like. Sorry, that's a long answer. I think purpose is important. Okay, great. Um, I, I see there's a few questions here about the Diploma in Leadership Development. So, so you might just talk about what people would should expect if they come on to the Diploma in Leadership Development. I know you touched on a lot of the areas that are covered on it. Um, yeah, great things. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I did touch on them, Maria. So if you recall what I talked about in terms of getting to know myself, so me in relationship to me, then me in relationship to other people, then how do I take those skills into me in relationship to teams or how do I understand systems and how am I within those systems? And then mm -hmm. how, am, how do I stay well while I'm doing all of this? That kind of is the way, um, the, the, that's the arc of the program, if you like. So the module, the first module is around me in relationship to me. 
then other, then team, then system, and then about how I stay well when I'm doing all of that. So that, that's kind of the arc. And you know how you experience it is that we do um, quite a lot of small group breakout work. We do plenary work. Uh, we do quite a bit of reflection. So we get people really to, uh, to, to flex their reflection muscles. Um, and uh, then kind of the assignments are built around trying something new. So it's a very experiential program because we can amass lots of knowledge around this, um, these sort of topics. But if we're not practicing something new, our emotional brain doesn't relearn that we can do it differently. Okay, great. And it's probably important to say that the program is designed for exec executives who are relatively senior in their career and you, and you need to be leading a team uh, to get the most out of it. Yeah, ab absolutely. In fact, that's, that's one of the few mandatory requirements of the program, Maria, is that you have to be leading a team because this is leadership in practice as opposed to leadership in theory. So leadership in theory, anybody can do, right, if they find it an interesting topic. But leadership in practice is how do I practice being a better leader? And it's hard to do that if you don't have somebody to lead. So that's... Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. And I think actually a, a lot of people who come on to the diploma uh, programs in Smurfit Executive Development, I suppose that's the difference between going straight into a university degree um, out, of, out of school. You're not learning about these apt concepts. They're all make sense. You're doing them every day in work. And um, as you say, it brings it much more to life. And, and thank you for saying that, Maria, because you've reminded me of something else I should say about the program is you will learn more from your fellow participants than you will learn from me or Eamon or Helen or whoever else is kind of partaking in the program from a faculty perspective. So that's really important. So we use the wisdom in the room, as we say, as the material for the learning. And, and so, you know, having people in the room who are also leading teams is, is, is important. Okay, great. Um, yeah, because we get a great mix of industries uh, on the programs, you know, everything from the public sector to ICTs to banks. So, as you say, you learn, you know, how people do it within their own industries and, and their own styles. And um, just from a, a practical point of view, um, I'll, I'll be sending out an email to everyone with all, all the full details, but the program is very much designed to fit uh, around busy working lives. Obviously, you have to commit the time to it, um, but it, it, it's six modules all together and they're run every six weeks. And um, so you, it's mandatory to be there for the, the, the two days of the module every six weeks. And then there's a certain amount of pre-weeding and as Camilla mentioned, assignments in between. But um, Camilla, I, like I think as you're saying, it's, it's very doable because it relates back to your working life. So it, it doesn't feel as, as something separate to it. Yeah, I think what people probably say, Marie, is that the volume of work is, is sometimes not as big as on some other programs, but it's the depth of, of reflection that they have to do um, sure. that is sometimes different. Now, sometimes, because there's some other programs that might also look for that, but um, you know, that's sometimes what people say is, is the difference for them. And, and as you say, that it is very, very practical. So typically people do a module on a Friday and a Saturday, and they can try something different on Monday, or indeed some people have gone home and tried something different at home. <laughs> um, so that's the idea, is that it is very practical and practice-based. Great, and look, as I said, it's starting on the 25th of February, and we have a, a max of 20 in the class, because as Camilla said, it's very high, highly experiential, and we all also like breaking into small groups, um, and, and being able to focus um, on, on a small class, for the first four modules are virtual, um, so a little like today, except uh, Camilla will be joined by her colleague, Eamon Ward. And um, then it will also run again in October if it doesn't suit you to start this uh, early. I have a few questions just coming in saying, you know, I don't lead a team, so um, it's not the right program for me. It, it's not at the moment because as Camilla said, you really need to be leading a, a team. It's, it's mandatory on this particular program, but maybe have a look at some of our other uh, diplomas that might be more suitable to you. Um, the other thing is that we've recorded this webinar today. So I will send you out um, the details of the recording. The other thing that people are asking is, um, Camilla, you mentioned um, a Harvard uh, study. Was it Tony? Uh, Tony Jack. Yeah, so uh, Camilla, you might be able to provide me with that reference because there's oh. people asking that they wanted to um, yeah. 
uh, too. And we have a lot of um, comments coming in here, Camilla, people who've already done the programme who are recommending it. So that's... Oh, lovely. <laughs> Hello yeah. so to they've, everyone. They, they've missed you. They've come back on for the webinar. Um, <laughs> so right. Camilla, I, I think if, if you don't have anything else, we might leave it there and let people get back to their work for the day. Lovely. Okay. Um, Look. Maria and I have a delay in our line, so if you notice us <laughs> stopping short, uh, uh, that's the reason for that. Um, I just want to say that uh, it was it was lovely doing this, um, and and maybe in in the spirit of of what we do in the program, and um, you know I love working one to one, and I love working with small groups of people I know, and I've become quite practiced of working with slightly larger groups, and um, even of people that I don't know. But doing this, which is talking to a big, quite a big group of people that I don't know at all and I can't see, I find quite terrifying. So in, in the spirit of transparency around this notion of fear, but, but it's important for me to be able to step out of my comfort zone as well, because my first instinct when Caroline Kinsler asked me to do it was, uh, no, I don't think so. My second instinct was, ah, Caroline's fabulous, so I'll do it. Um, but my third instinct was, this stuff is important. And whether you do it with, with me or with UCD or somewhere else, this stuff is really, really important. And so that's my purpose, if you like to use the, 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 that word purpose, is that people would kind of work on this stuff for themselves to make themselves more comfortable and more productive as leaders. And so I have to enact that also. I have to enact doing something uncomfortable. So that's my, um, so, so thank you for, for the opportunity to enact that discomfort. <laughs> um, and I look forward perhaps to seeing some of you in, in the future. Great. Thank you so much, Camilla. And yes, sorry, I kept interrupting you because there is a little bit of a delay. But look, thank you very much for this morning and for your time. And thank you to Mario in the background for doing all the IT and allaying our fears from that point of view. So uh, I, as I said, everyone, I will send you out an email with the recording and um, please come back to me if you have any questions. Thanks again. Great. Thank you.